Hello, Legionnaires, and welcome to some Rando RPG livestream. Tonight, our panel of Dungeon Masters, Game Masters, Referees, Storytellers, and Players will share their diverse tabletop role-playing game experiences to provide ideas, suggestions, and possibly even some advice for your tabletop RPG sessions. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to some Rando RPG live stream. I am John, I'm Max Leoslo, and I am truly grateful you are with us for tonight's live stream discussion on rules as written, house rules, and home brewing. So, what do we do here on some Rando RPG live stream? Well, in segments one through four, we discuss topics surrounding the tabletop RPG hobby with an emphasis on individual, I got my pencil ready, I'm ready to teach tonight. Ah! Individual experiences, desires, and expectations. In tonight's four segments on rules as written, house rules, and home brewing, we will we hope to provide ideas, suggestions, and food for thoughts for your tabletop RPG sessions. Now, in segment five, if you know these guys want to hang around for that, if you want to hang around for that, we let down our hair and just talk about nerd issues of interest. And if we meet the giveaway threshold, we will do that during segment five as well. Please consider supporting Legion of Myth through the links in the live stream's description. YouTube takes 30% and Twitch takes 50% of your hard-earned money, while Rumble, PayPal, Streamlabs, and Ko-Fi take between 0 and 5%. As normal, Rumble rants and Super Chats are less than $20. I will read at the end of each segment. Those of $20 or more, I will interrupt the segment to read your rant or chat as immediately as I can. I will let somebody finish this point. And $50 or more, I will drink in your name, and you can force the panel to answer any tabletop RPG-related question of your choice right then and there. Yes, it has to be tabletop RPG-related, and you can't have a seven-parter. If you make $100 or more in Super Chats or Rumble Rants, so it'll be a $25 Palladium Books or drive through RPG gift card giveaway during Segment 5. And Legion Myth YouTube members, as well as tonight's Super Chatters, Rumble Ranters, have the opportunity to win. But you must be watching at the time of the giveaway to claim your victory. Else it will roll over into the next week. Two other uh, announcements. Uh, here have Max's Crap giveaway is still going on. You can read details about that in the uh, giveaway or contest. What do I call it over here in Discord? Do, 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 do. Contest, a uh, little form there on Discord. Or if you go to the YouTube community tab, you can scroll down a little bit. You'll see a nice giveaway image on there. And it talked about that. We're giving away in nomine, pretty much like the complete set from Steve Jackson's game, Mutants and Masterminds. Of what, Barry, did you say it was first edition? First edition and Star Trek Adventures. Uh, we will be doing that giveaway on the 24 hour charity live stream for the Winter Warrior Project, which will be on the 11th of November, aka Veterans Day. Don't forget that uh, Legion of Moderators, one of which is on the panel tonight, <laughs> will time out or even ban people who attack any panelists or chatter. Attack the argument, not the person. Keep your very social media beefs off my show. If you want a beef, you come in December. I think it's December 13th. They're all scheduled out there. If you want to beef with me or any of whoever's on the panel that day, you come on that one. I'm pretty sure it's December 13th. You can come. Air your grievances out. Come on, haters. Bring it on. Oh, let me taste those E-tears. Uh, <laughs> where are we? So, yeah, please like, subscribe, and share. And I do not have the panelists in the description yet unless you're watching this on video later, but I will get them in the description as we go through the live stream here. But please be sure to subscribe to all of them. And if you've got anything other than your YouTube channel that you want me to link in the description, please put it in the private chat, guys. So with that, let's get started. All right. We have our three panelists with us tonight up in the top row because he just logged in first. There's no special reason for it other than I actually was going to suggest you swap me with Matt since Matt hasn't been here in so long. It's like an event. No, <laughs> I need to keep him humble. I need to keep him humble down yeah. there. Yeah, which is why I'm in the last place. I just prefer to go after him than before him. <laughs> That's okay. because you like. Never mind. <laughs> Fine. Should there you go. California. You're, now you're in the complete. When we do the clockwise circle, at least on my screen, you're in the complete last place. Canada, Canada, we're on and, the bottom. And Lord and Lord Mattias is like the That's middle child we're... who's going to act out now. Good job. Marching, marching, marching. <laughs> no, I'm the one that gets forgotten. That gets forgotten. There you go. That's yeah. why you have to act out, right? Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, <laughs> all right. So with us today, we have Crafty Matt. Who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Um, so my name is Crafty Matt. I am at Crafty Matt Craft on uh, Twitter. Uh, 
I belong to a couple of different discords. I'm an admin on Legion of Myth. I also belong to the um, uh, TBE and Associates uh, Attorneys at Raw. And uh, <laughs> it's appropriate. Um, my my tabletop gaming experience, I started in third grade with uh, BASIC. And um, I got invited to a bunch of sixth graders table as their torchbearer and been playing ever since. Actually started younger than me because third grade is about eight years old. I started when I was 10. Dang it. It was, it was at a cafeteria game. I watched them because they had all the miniatures, you know, and the graph paper and all, and it fascinated me. And finally they said, Hey, we need a torchbearer and somebody to carry our, uh, uh, our treasure. <laughs> How about that kid? Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, I can't find my stuff here. All right, below him, we have once again returning to the show, Lord Amadeus. As always, who are you? What content do you create or products? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Um, yeah, Lord Amadeus. Uh, my Twitter handle is right below me there, Lord Amadeus2312. Um, I got a YouTube channel, a blog. I, I'm, if I don't stop doing something, I kind of lose my mind. So I'm constantly working on something. Um, I like to write things. I'm kind of a freelancer, uh, written for Lamentations of the Flame Princess, the Red Room. I recently got second place in a Shadow Dark Halloween game jam, only at Giant Slayer Games. Go check it out. It's free. Um, and uh, my tabletop RPG experience started in third grade, sort of. Someone showed me what D&D is because I had been hearing about it. I had no idea. He, he, they did all the rolling. They're like, you're a magic user. You're attacked by a giant moth. You cast magic missile. You did four damage. You got three copper pieces. That's D&D. &D. And I was like, oh. Two couple of years later, I found the red box set. And it was like, oh. Uh, so I bought it. I convinced my dad to uh, buy it for me. And I've been playing ever since. Um, I just absolutely love the game. And um, I played quite a bit in the 90s. And I've gotten back into it in the past 10 years. Um when in the osr so so now, you're another did you attack the darkness with your oh <laughs> uh, that was definitely a running gag <laughs> <laughs> and then now buried by the cat uh we have bear back once again on the show bear uh who are you what content or products do you create and how long have you been in the hobby I'll play along and not do my usual thing. I am Bear the Genix GM. I run Zeg Media, aka Zenith Comics. Uh, I have my own channel, Bear the Genix GM. You see the uh, down there for it and the name. Uh, currently producing Heroic, running my Patreon, and also working on a uh, fantasy um, post apocalyptic, slightly horror role playing game called Final Age right now. Uh, that'll come out when it comes out. They use the BRP engine modified, and, which is fun for this topic. And uh, unlike these people, my testicles had dropped when I joined and learned how to play role oh, wow. games. So I was only 15 when I learned. I'm so sorry I wasn't an impressionable young prepubescent like you gentlemen were. But I've been playing since 85, and uh, I've, I've walked away from Dungeons & Dragons, but that doesn't mean I don't get the craving for it from time to time. But for the most part, I prefer BRP these days. Well, if it makes you feel better, while I technically started at age 10, I didn't know what was going on, and then Satanic Panic, yada yada, Battletech, whatever, I didn't really get back into role-playing until I was 14, 15 years old, so, you know. That doesn't make me feel better, but thank you for sharing. Okay, well, I tried. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, crafty and and again, all three of you, if you have any special links, I can't see what's on the screen there because I have everything split screen for me here. So if you have like your Twitter link or whatever you want people to go to, please put that in private chat and I will get that in the description. Bear and Lord Mattias, your YouTube channels are in here. One last shout out because he shouted out Crafty is the first comment for today. Tabletop Family said, hello, Crafty Matt. And I suggest that people go subscribe to Tabletop Family's channel. Uh, I'll just leave it at that because I don't have a lot of time to do advertisement, but check it out if you don't know. It's, all, it's three words, Tabletop Family. All right, so the first thing I want to do before I dive into any questions here is I want to define quickly, in just, in just a really quick manner, rules as written, house rules, and homebrew. So I'm going to lay out a quick definition here, and let's just see if we can go with it or if we're going to get into some sort of weird argument. Rules as written is pretty self-explanatory. If that's how the rule is written, you do it. Cool? Yes. All right, no complaints there. 
<laughs> house rule, a ruling at the table, whether it's a quick rule chain, uh, some sort of adjudication, whatever, this is how we're ruling it here. This is our house rule. This is how we handle it. It's either a gap in the rules or, or a minor change that you want to make to facilitate something. Are we good with that? Yeah, okay. kind of. Kind of, okay, well, and then homebrew is basically revamping the game. For example, I consider settings to effectively be so, like, uh, uh, Dark Sun is a homebrew version of Dungeons and Dragons, or Dragonlance is a homebrew version of Dungeons and Dragons. That's kind of how I look. If you have major overhaul, then it's a homebrew. Are we good with those three definitions going forward, or do you guys want to make a quick change to something? Um, yeah, I mean, just a like a slight tweak, so okay. everything else is fine. But as far as rules as written, rules as written is correct. That's that's the definition. Ah, well, we'll get to that momentarily. He's choosing violence. He's choosing yes. Violence. <laughs> All right. Well, now with that said, tonight. <laughs> no. um, okay. Cool. So I will ask the question, then I will get that into the description. All right. So starting with Crafty, then, because apparently you've got an opinion about this. <laughs> How do you approach running a game strictly by the rules as written? Um, so it's kind of a, I mean, it's a process because no one, and I'm, I'm awful pedantic about this. And like, I'm very, very direct about this when I talk about it on Twitter and any place else, but in all honesty, playing rules as written is it's more of like, it's a desire than it is a possibility, right? What I mean by that is everybody interprets rules differently. So to play by rules as written means that you have to first read the book. Oh, God, you yes. Then you then have to find like-minded individuals who have also read the book. You guys discuss the rules, and then you decide how, and then you discuss the rules, and you get basically come to a consensus of how the rules should be played as written. And then you try to adhere to that as closely as you can, even with all of the ugly rules. So 1E, for example, grappling rules. You play with them. Okay. So what specifically motivates you to adhere strictly to Raw with such fervor in your games? Uh, it's a challenge. So, and, and honestly, like the... Rules is written the way that they are in the book is it's like a lingua franca, right? It's it is the common language of the game to where if I'm playing rules is written and I go to a game store or a convention and I'm talking to somebody else about their game experience, if their game is a bunch of house rules, then we're not speaking the same language, right? Um, I come from I, I come from a tournament background in fighting games where I went to I, I went and played at tournament fighting games, right? And the way that you the way that you approach that is is you use everything that is in the game to your disposal, right? And that's how you play the game correctly. There are people in fighting games that will say, Oh, I don't like when you use this special move, so we're not going to use this special move or this or that, right? And and honestly, the challenge to playing with rules as written is in the follow-up question, but how do you stay creative while following the rules? Well, that's that's the challenge, right? There's a challenge in playing it specifically by the rules. For example, AD and D, right? I know everybody hates it, I know, and I know I'm going to say it, but one to one time, one to one downtime, right? It's a paragraph this big in the DMG on page 37 but we try to adhere to those rules because it is a challenge. And because of that challenge, we have fun. Hmm. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I just can't agree. <laughs> so no, and, and that's fine. And, and no, and, and I understand, I understand that, but, but most people play to have fun. We, we, so people like me, people who play strictly by the rules, have fun reading the rules, discussing the rules, and then trying to play the game by the rules. Sure. And from that challenge, fun arises. So I don't normally ask a second follow-up, but I'm going to do it in this case because uh, I, I want this to be clear. You don't make this demand of other people. You make this as a demand at your own table, right? Kind of like for me, I require first person interact, you know, with with your character. I require you to talk in first person, but that's for my table. I don't make that demand of other tables. It's this it, it this is a complicated question because 
I, I don't like anybody can play any way that they want. Right. But the demand that I'm going to make is if you want to play a better game, right. Because again, it wouldn't be my, if, if I didn't have this opinion or if I didn't think my opinion was correct, I wouldn't have my opinion. Right. And so for me, right. Going like really studying the game and playing the game rules as written and as intended, I think, in my opinion, I get this higher level of fun and I want everybody else to experience that. So I tell people, hey, play the game as intended and find out what happens. And everybody goes, no, I throw out all the rules and everything like that. And it's like, but then you're not experiencing the game, right? Okay. You're experiencing kind of the game, but I challenge, I don't demand but I challenge everybody to play the game rules as written. Well, if it makes you feel better, we might have you back next year then, because I have a topic that's going to happen next year at some point called rules as written versus rules as intended. So uh, <laughs> we'll talk about, talk about that then, but let's move on down to Lord Mattias here. Same primary question for you. How do you approach running a game strictly by rules as written? Now, just so the audience knows real quickly, uh, in this first segment here, I didn't even say this. Uh, we're talking, this first segment is about adhering to the letter. So the segment one, so we're going to be talking positively or our thoughts about raw next segment. We'll move on past that, et cetera, et cetera. So right now we're specifically talking about rules as written adhering to the letter of the law. So I forgot to mention at the beginning. Um, uh, so, well, to answer your question, um, I'm in large agreement actually with Crafty on this to a point. Um, I think, uh, cause I'm, I, I approach these, these things as a realist, you know, as a game master, you're doing more than just memorizing a bunch of rules and adjudicating them at the table. You're managing a group of people, a group of individuals and their experience. And I, you, you actually have a very important role to play at the table. So, um, you know, so I just, it just coming up with times when I would use rules as written is obviously at a convention game where I've, I, it's a bunch of nobodies. They don't know me. They don't trust me. And the best way to get trust is to play rules as written. This is how the game is played. I'm not going to hand you a, a binder this thick with all my special little rules or whatever. Um, but also, we got to remember when we talk about these things, again, I'm a realist. I don't want to, like, ha get lost in the clouds. Um you know, 95% of the time, people who are watching these videos are playing games with their friends, and that's pretty much it. So you kind of know each other. So for me, rules as written is important when I come to my come to my friends and I say, hey, guys, I picked up this new game. I really like it. I think we should check it out. And invariably, I got a couple friends who were like, well, this looks a little weird. Maybe we should change it. And I go, uh, uh, uh. we're going to play rules as written for a little bit. We're going to, like, learn this game. OK, but then there comes a point and this is where I, I kind of this is where I deviate from crafty. Uh, there comes a point where um, you've been playing the game for a while and say six months, a year. I don't want to put a time limit where your table starts having a particular experience with a particular set of the rules. And maybe it's time to house rule them at that point to to make sure everyone's sort of enjoying the game. But generally speaking, I don't have a problem with if you're learning the set of rules, you absolutely should be rules is written and i will go a step further than crafting go if you're not doing that you're doing it wrong you can't just pick up a dmg or a player's handbook and, and just not read it and just make up stuff willy-nilly and and say you're playing D, &D because you watched critical role once or something what right? are you talking about that's how everybody learns these days <laughs> i watched it on a video um right but no, you absolutely should be. And and I say this, and I guess I, I hope Crafty, you can agree with me on this because I know you're all about the challenge. And I agree with you. There is a challenge there in like learning the synergy, that syntax mm -hmm. between the rules that sometimes you can't even put into words. You just have a feeling about it, right? You're not going to get that as a game master if you're not reading the rules and playing them and understanding them before you start house ruling them. And I know and, I'm, and I'm there's to jump an addition again. to that. I, well, hold, hold on. We're, yeah. We'll get to the crosstalk uh, section uh, later. So just hold on, on to that. Yeah, I, and I know I don't want to jump ahead. Uh, where I kind of disagree with you about the house rule part, that's when you've been playing for a little while and your table, the unique synergy, that unique thing that's happening at your table with those particular individuals may come a time where, yeah, it's time to house rule a few things because a particular rule is just not working. Right. For right or wrong, it's just not working. Right. So, but you can't do that until you've played. 
raw oh. and really understood that syntax, if that makes sense. So how do you handle a situation where rules as written might be unclear or open to interpretation and it causes dispute at the table? Oh, that's kind of depends on the kind of game you're playing. Like if you're playing a crunchier game, you know, I'll pick on Adventure Conquer King System. There's a rule for everything. There should be a rule for it that you can put to. And at the end of the day, if there is a dispute, the buck stops with the game master. I'm that kind of a game master. This is my table. This is how I'm running it. We can disagree. We'll take a few minutes to talk about it, but we're not going to spend 20 minutes talking about it. I've made the ruling. We're going to move on. And if if it means that much, you we can continue talking about it away from the table. Now, if it's a more classic D&D game like BX, where there's a lot of open to interpretation, that, that's where the ruling over rules comes in. And I don't see that as house ruling. That's just you're making up a rule because of a gap in the rule um, for that particular situation. That particular situation may come up again. It may come up again, but it's slightly different, and it might require a different interpretation. But to me, that's not... That, that's weird, because uh, to me, that's the literal definition of house rule, but uh, okay. Yeah, well, when I think of house rule, I, I think of me handing you a list of hey guys this is this is how i'm changing things it's like I, I, I personally I, without getting into we can talk about this a little later but i think it's both personally but I mean, yeah uh, that's, I think that's I, the fair. only reason i care about the definition because i really don't care about your definition or crafty or whatever it's uh, because you're playing the games the way you want to play is so that when as when the video comes out when people are talking and chat and so forth we're all on the same page other other than that oh, yeah, i'm not no. trying to be pedantic about this so got to define um, your terms i get yeah. it yeah okay bear let me ask you the question. How do you approach running the game strictly by the rules as written? And real quickly, you can't say I don't. <laughs> you have to try. <laughs> so I have never purchased a game that I have read and thought every rule is a gem. Mm -hmm. There is no game I've ever purchased where I have thought, oh, this makes perfect sense. And then when we got to the table, it played exactly as I thought it would based on how I read the rules. But, well, actually, there's one. Marvel Saga, probably one of the greatest superhero games ever made. People hate it because it was cards and it was the 90s. And oh no, cards are killing the hobby because of magic. So whatever. But a friend of mine is an animator. And he once looked at some art in a role playing game that I will not say the name of and said, Did this fucking artist even learn anatomy first? Because he was trying to do a cartoony style, like a Saturday morning animation style of art but he clearly had no understanding of anatomy. So when you're watching Ben 10, or you're watching Bugs Bunny, or you're watching whatever cartoon you want, the characters don't cross the uncanny valley because the animators understood anatomy. And by understanding the anatomy, they're able to then exaggerate or change things, but it still looks like a person. It still looks like what it's supposed to represent. Well, it's the same thing with rules as written. You cannot change the rules unless you know the rules. So obviously you should be playing the game a few, a few times to um, master it, or at least learn it well enough that you can then see what doesn't work for you and where you'll need to make some changes. Uh, I disagree with, and, and this is not meant as an attack, gentlemen. I'm just, it's the only word that I can use to describe most of what Matt said and a tiny bit of what Mateus said. So please, I'm not attacking you. It's just the only word, and I can't think of a better word right now. The pretension about the rules is irrelevant to me. Gygax didn't even use his own damn rules. Saying something was in the Dungeon Master's Guide, therefore it's a rule, is bullshit. The Dungeon Master's Guide was a secondary book. It always has been. It always will be. The Player's Handbook in D&D is where the rules of the game are found. And then expanded upon in the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual. So when it comes down to games, the core rules are what you must learn before you can change them. After okay. that, everything's free game. Now, before... Because we will have a moment here, obviously, after I do the follow-up here where they can counter and so forth. But uh, what benefits do you see in sticking closely to RAW, especially in complex or unfamiliar systems? I, I do appreciate Matt's statement about Linga Franca, even though I don't agree with it 100%. I do understand what he's saying or what he's trying to put across, which is that if you use the rules as written and, and Matt Mateus is using the same rules as written and Matt's using the same rules as written and you're using the same rules as written, we won't have to explain things to each other in an ideal situation. 
but we all know damn well everybody's going to interpret the rules the way they want, and that's why rules arguments exist. There is no lexicon. There is no Rosetta Stone. There is no Linga Franca. There is merely a bunch of people speaking the same language, but with their own little cultural, you know, Minnesotan, Canadian, hey Californian, <laughs> whatever. You know, all putting our own little accent on it, if you will. Uh, but the benefit is, is that there is a common touch point. So much like in the, in the rabbinical studies, the word is day. How long the day is, you can argue until the end of time. But we all agree the word is day, and we will never argue that point. So that's what it gives us. It gives us that sort of base to work from. Okay. I do have a follow-up that I'm going to ask all of you, but at this point, go ahead and, uh, you know, if you want to ask each other questions, counter, whatever, go ahead, Crafty. So, so real quick, while I agree with Bear that in more modern D&Ds, the DMG may be an optional book or a guide, but in first edition, it is an absolutely required book because all of the rules are in the DMG <laughs> in first edition. So there Sad are... True. There are no rules for how to attack monsters in the player's handbook. There is no rules for actually how to roll up your stats in the player's handbook. They just don't exist. Fair enough, so, but AD&D First Edition is a garbage game, and I'm going to leave it at that right there. So if you want to, you want to um, go the road, we'll go the road. Send so, your but, hate to bear the Gen X GM. Yeah, send your hate to add bear the Gen yeah, X GM, but please. The, so th that is why... And what uh, what what Lord Mattias, what Bear is saying is that's why it's really important that not only do you have to you have to read the rules right, but your interpretation of the rules is going to be different than somebody else's. So you have to find a like minded group, and this is the important part because the the question was how do you implement rules as written at the table you have to find like-minded people so that you can sit and discuss how to implement the rules at the table right and honestly what that requires is in my opinion is that requires everybody at the table be familiar with the rules if i can turn to james and say hey i'm not too sure on this rule, you know, and then he goes, oh yeah, no, that's this, 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 and this, right? So that way, everybody at the table is is on board. I know like guys like Mr. Max and all of them, those 4D guys, they are, they want the rules to fade into the background and the role playing to come forward. The only way to do that is for everybody to know the rules so that we can all play by the rules. And you know, but, but your... so, so uh, I'm going to jump in here because the, you're talking about them. They actually have the same philosophy as you on the opposite side of the spectrum, where it's vet the player, vet the player, vet the player. Yeah, and and so I I don't say like vet the player. What I say is I say find like minded players, right? Find find people who share the same passion for playing raw that you do. If if somebody is not going to put in the dedication to play a game raw, then that may not be the. So how does this help new table. players? Or at this point, and to be fair, this might not be a consideration at this point. I'm uh, but uh, how does this help new players? Um, so when I started with, uh, Redbox, right? So I started as the torchbearer, skip ahead a few years. Randy had the, uh, this guy, Randy that I know actually kid, cause we were in fifth grade at the time. He had the red box. He sold it to me for 15, uh, $15, right? Cause he didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. So what we did during, uh, lunchtime is we actually sat down and we used like the little key guides and we would make maps. And we would just run each other back and forth through our own adventures until we understood the rules. He went out and he bought the red box again, even though he sold me his, because we had come to this understanding of by, I get, I guess you would say vetting, but it's just conversation back and forth. We're brand new players, but in playing in me running a game for him and then him running a game for me, we came to this like, okay, so this is how the game is run, Right. And then we would invite new people in and they would run games for us and we would run games for them. And we just, but, but I specifically, because I specifically remember sitting at the cafeteria table and drawing out maps. And then, you know, of course the bullies would come over, they would take our paper, crunch it up. They'd throw our dice halfway across the, across the yard and stuff like that. But it's that experience of as new players sitting down, reading this, 
this book and then the aha moment of, oh, that's so cool, right? Okay. Um, to Bear's point of even Gary didn't play that way, well, I don't care how Gary played, right? The rules are written in the... you play then. Ah, <laughs> no, I, no, no, I, but, which, which is fine, which is fine. And and you don't have to care how I play, but I don't care I because I, everybody says, oh, well, that's not how Gary played. I don't care. He wrote the rules in the book for a reason, so I am going to run the rules in the book as a challenge to see if it can be done. Okay. Lord Maddie, she wanted yeah. to jump in. Yeah, I because you you were talking about you know for new players, and this is why, and this is where I kind of disagree with a lot of what Crafty is saying, and not not the substantive, but sort of like I guess the approach maybe. Um, because again, I'm a realist. The people who are gonna be watching this, the vast majority of people who are who are not watching this and playing D D or role-playing games, they're a group of friends, they're they're not like have some deep calling to go find the perfect group of players. No, it's, <laughs> these are your friends and, and you're going to play these games. And yes, there's going to be in dif interpretation, uh, you know, differences of interpretation. Um, and that's where the house ruling stuff starts to seep in. Um, but again, like it, I, I get, I don't necessarily disagree with wanting the challenge of rules mm -hmm. as written. Um, I I'm, I'm, I'm known as the mud core guy. Like I love it. I love, I don't mind having my first, level character get killed i don't mind having five in a row get killed because it's just hard and that's the way it is um i like that challenge so i, I appreciate um what crafty is saying uh but just from like i guess like an advice practical advice perspective um you know if you if you're really into the challenge but the only group of players you have are your buddies who want to eat cheetos drink some mountain dew or if they're older drinking beer and whatnot um you know Maybe maybe house drilling is something you might want to consider after you've played R A W uh, and learned them. So that's just my can, my can opinion. I, yeah, yeah, like this is this is the crosstalk time. Go ahead. I, well, so, 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 so Bear so Lord, does well, want to jump in at some point here. <laughs> just real quick, just just a quick question for Lord Mattias is um, now if your if your friends just want to sit down, drink beer, have Cheetos and stuff like that, right? Everybody knows that I play the world's like most awful game because everybody hates it but me and that's Conan 2D20, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, because I, I'm everybody on this panel is like, oh, 2D20, gross. Um, I've never played it, and I'm interested. Just parts of it. <laughs> gross. Um, but, but honestly, uh, so I, I don't mind... I don't mind having like a beer and pretzels game, right? But if I am a type of person that I want to play a game raw and I want to do that, so Lord Mattias, wouldn't you go and and try and find people? And once you have found those people, befriend those people, so those people do become your friends, and then you end up playing raw with friends. Oh well, yeah, of course. I mean, you can always go hunt down people if you really, really want to. I just, I think you're speaking from a very, um, a very min like a minority position, right? There's, of course, I, I, I think yeah. you're kind of a, <laughs> uh, what, uh, there's an expression like you're like the unicorn or something. Um, but well, on the 4D side, Sean are called them one percenters. I mean, like they're motorcycle <laughs> game. <laughs> yeah, right. So, and and I don't. And again, I'm not going to say don't don't do what Crafty says per se. If like you really want to have that challenge, and truth be told, my in-person gaming crew took one look at Lamentations of the Flame Princess and were like, "What? No." So I went and I opened up a Discord server and I started detracting people. And now I play Lamentations all the time. I'm a, I'm I'm mm -hmm. a happy guy. Um, so I don't necessarily disagree with you on that. Um, and certainly if if that is the experience you want, uh, all I'm saying is I think the most, the, the approach that one ought to take with the raw situation is very practical. Just do it, see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, because you're, you and your table, because it's like sort of like this living thing and is it working for you? There's no shame in just saying, hey, what can we change that's specific to us? And I would argue, and I know we're not there yet, that same game master who moves to another table playing the exact same game should also play Raw, even though he has some experience with this other table, because what they might want to change might be a little different. So I'm looking at it more from the table perspective, but I, I don't necessarily well, disagree. We do have to move on to the next question. I know but Bear anyway. wants to jump in here, so right. Bear... 
Go ahead. Okay. Move on to the next question. I'm good. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to ask my last follow-up here. I will at some point maybe, but I'm not going to do it now. Uh, so let's look at it. We don't have any Super Chats yet. Uh it's weird. Super Chats usually come in in segments three and four, not one and two. But I did a couple of things that I did want to point out here. So uh, Francois, Frank, who's been on the show before, says, Cooks learn the recipe first. Chefs know the recipe in and out and how to shape it to make it better. And generally speaking, I'm tipping my hand as the host, but I don't care. Uh, I generally agree with what Lord Mattis has been saying so far. I love the concept. Crafty and I have talked about this, too. Learn the game. Play the game raw first. You don't change any rules until you know why you want to change it, why it's not working at your table. So I, je I tend to agree with that. Uh-oh. Um, I can't show it on the screen because of how the API works, but a $20 uh, Rumble rant from Grizzly Beardo says, do you ever flex back from a house rule to, oh, okay, yeah. And I think this is going to come up later, but that's fine. We, uh, if it doesn't, we can answer it now. This question's for you guys. Do you ever flex back from a house rule back to raw? If so, when would you do that? And how do you maintain the player's buy-in? Thank you for the $20, Grizzly Beardo. And we'll start with Crafty. Have you ever go, whoops, that no. house rule is dumb. Let's go back to raw. Yeah, when we, when we implement a house rule, and then it turns out that the house rule broke raw, like, or like it, you it, played it broke, is what you're saying <laughs> yeah it broke something like so completely that we're like oops we because we didn't see the ripples in the water yep. right so um so we we would change stuff and i mean going back to um go, going back to to 1e it would be the grappling rules right mm -hmm. so most people don't understand that the grappling rules are the are the way that they are so that a character with a low with a low hit probability can attack somebody with a low AC and in AD and D lower AC better. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. So so the grappling rules are there so that a character can still do something against somebody who may be more powerful than them and be okay. able to subdue them. Right. If we, we change the we change the grappling rules to be uh, as an like an at hit or a skill or something like that, a percentage. Right. Mm -hmm. And it completely broke. And to us, it broke the game because now anytime that you came up against a high level character, you couldn't do anything. There was nothing. There was no mm -hmm. other than running away. There was there was no solving that encounter. OK, uh, Lord Mattias, same question for you. Do you ever flex back from a house rule back to raw? Yeah, um, no, no specific uh, example comes to mind, but I know it's happened where we all of a sudden just kind of, you know, collectively sit back from the table and go, wait, this this doesn't make any sense. Oops, I think we made a mistake. Um, and I, I don't think there's any shame as a game master to say, hey, guys, I made a mistake. We got to, you know, what we've been doing, we're not going to do it anymore. Um, we're all human. And I again, I think that actually builds trust, too, if you're just honest with your players and say, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I made a mistake. So, yeah, that happens, and it's bound to happen. And I think, not to beat a dead horse, it's more likely to happen if you haven't really played Rules as Written before learning the game. But, you know, all the syntax. And, and, and I don't mean just memorizing the like rules, but understanding that syntax, that synergy, that unspoken thing that glues all the rules together. Because Crafty is right. There is an experience playing raw that you're not going to get, obviously, if you start changing everything. The question, though, is, is it right for your table? Because at the end of the day, this is all about having fun. So, Okay. Bear, same question for you. Have you ever flexed back from a house rule to raw? Yeah, of course. Uh, no specific example either comes to mind, but it's that expression I use when I used to tinker with 5e. Oh, no, no, no. Don't tug on that. You never know what it's connected to. <laughs> yeah. and that's one of the mm -hmm. big problems with these overly engineered games is that they're fun, they play well, but one little thing changes and suddenly the whole, oh, that has an effect four levels down the road. That's, uh, yeah. that's why I don't play games like that anymore, right? I play games that present the rules right out of the gate. You start playing with them the way they're designed and they don't change as the game plays. Sadly, very, I shouldn't say sadly, positively, very few games do that anymore. That is a leftover 70s, 80s design mechanism that was already losing popularity in the 80s. And by the 90s, most people had just moved on to other types of game design and left that beast in the past. 
Uh, had we not had the OSR, we probably wouldn't even be talking about D and D that much anymore. Uh, so you know, it's it's one of those things. It is definitely a D and D um, pitfall, more so than say a Call of Cthulhu pitfall or a Marvel superheroes pitfall. Yes, there are instances you could point to. You could absolutely get into the weeds and find them. But I think overall class and level systems are the ones that are going to have the biggest problem with that because of the way yeah. they do graduated game change. I, I have. Are you, are you talking specifically like the like the Beckme boxes where every box introduced new mechanics until you get to Immortals and it's a completely different game? That or the fact that you know the game you're playing at level one is not the game you're playing at level six or at level ten or at level fifteen in the modern D and D stuff. You know it changes. The game changes, and when you tug on something at first or second level as a rule. Eh, Suddenly, level seven, it unravels and becomes a mess because of this unexpected change. So that's all. That's all I'm saying. Okay. All right, Christian yeah, Beardo, thank you. Very, oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the twenty dollars. Appreciate that. Let's knock out these last two comments so we get to the next question. Uh, Mr. Max Bovano says we actually demand that people are familiar with the rules so we don't have to talk about them at the table again. But the point was about vetting uh, the players, I, so uh, to speak. So can I make a joke on Mr. Max's? Uh, uh, of course. <laughs> Dad, no one cares about your stupid Vietnam stories. <laughs> and then uh, Francois says, uh, I challenge anyone to play Palladium Rules Raw. <laughs> that's I, I that, like Actually, that's that why the, the conversation that. next year is going to be rules as written versus rules as intended, because sometimes you have to have that. But uh, I'd love to have uh, Joe from Biggest Geek is on, because he is adamant that you cannot know developer's intent, and I disagree with him on that. But I would like to Unless you talk to the developer. Go, go ahead, Bear. I'd like to comment on something Mr. DeRoche said earlier, which was the chef analogy. Yeah, yep. Well, it's not a fucking cooking class. It's a goddamn role-playing game. <laughs> and something Matt said earlier, but I challenged myself. Great, I'm here to have fun with my friends. Now, if challenging yourself is the way you have fun, awesome. Not the way we have fun. We have fun by playing the game and having a good time and laughing and playing great characters and all that. But again, of the lot of us, I am the dirty, filthy story gamer. So the rules matter less to me in those situations. You know, we're probably, no, no I'd have to flip with you, Barrick. So I say we're kind of in this circle where he'd be the hardest core rules, then him, then me, then you. Yeah. So, eh. all right, That's we fair. do have, unless it's important, we do have to move on to the next question. All right, we are going to do that now then. Okay, now we're going to start with Lord Mattias. So how do you manage player creativity when it might clash with Raw? Now, for folks out there, real quickly, the premise of this question is about things like in old D&D, &D, you didn't really have a lot of rules, so to speak. You just had your character. <laughs> I'm a dwarf. I attack things and I get a couple of bonuses. Now in modern games, everything's so statted out. You got like 32 characters, you know, pages of that character sheet to find out what feats work with this feat center. So the point being with the question is the rules have all this stuff working together, but the character, the player wants to do something. And I'll even throw out if, if this seems to go off the rails, I have a perfect scenario from the, the game that I was in with, uh, uh, uh forge and brush gaming, uh, GM alcove, uh, but let's start with Lord Mattias on this one. How do you manage player creativity when it might clash with Raw? Um, this is actually why I, uh, yeah, why I actually started moving back into the OSR where you have more leeway, uh, ruling over rules type stuff. But I think if you know the rules well enough, what you don't need to know chapter and verse, figure out what page number everything is, you know, recite it on command. You can find a way to translate the the idea to a whatever it is like I, uh, an example would be um, back when I was actually running some fifth edition stuff. I had a guy who was playing a cleric who kind of wanted to do monk like things. I guess he wanted to be like really good at, with the staff right out of the gate. And I said, yeah, you could do that. And here's how at this level, you get this feat at second level, you get that feat at third level, you do this and, blah, blah, blah. and you'll be able to have that character, man. You'll just kind of have to work your way to it. To me, it made perfectly perfect sense. You're, you're building up to be a staff master. He, of course, wanted to be a staff master at level one. Um, but you will, I, in my opinion, you should be able to find something that you can do that. In Earth, on. <laughs> I'm sure Axe has a rule for it. But anyway, the um, so, yeah, I think you can. I think you can just find the rule that fits. Um, and I don't think rules is written. I think one of the 
criticisms of rules is written is that it hinders creativity. And I disagree, actually. I think it can actually foster creativity because it's forcing players. And I think this is some of the challenge that Crafty's getting at uh, forces the players to think. And um, they'll start thinking in terms of like what this, the rules are and how they, how they uh, translate into that emergent story, that fantasy world that we're all sharing at the table. So I, I don't, I don't think it's that challenge. I don't think it's that difficult. Why I prefer rules lighter games in this sort of situation <laughs> is because you're going to end up getting some pushback from players like the guy who wanted to be a staff master as a level one cleric. It's like, well, why can't I do it now? Well, to go to what Bear was saying, um, I tug this and the, all of a sudden the entire game is going to break in a couple levels if I let you do this now. Especially if you start looking around the table, people who are playing raw, who are playing by the rules and who have mapped out their character progression and are planning on being a sword master at level four um they're gonna look and be like what are you doing this isn't fair you know what i mean so um uh so yeah that's that's but that's really me just not liking 5e <laughs> but, okay do you do you use session zero to set these kind of expectations about raw and creativity or is that something that just comes up during play i don't generally do session zeros um but that's more be because with my in-person gaming crew we gather once a month for like an eight hour session so we're kind of communicating by a text leading up to it so i guess maybe that's the session zero and then with my online games i have my discord server so like we kind of i kind of let people know ahead of time this is what's expected because what i want to do is session one we roll up characters we start playing uh, and that that's what I look forward to. And that's what I try to do. And if that means I do a little extra legwork leading up to it to make sure every, I know everyone's on board, that, to me, that's just my job as a game master. It's not a big deal. So, so okay. I guess, in a, I guess the answer is yes, I get, I kind of go over it, but I don't have a formal session zero. No, it makes sense. Makes sense. All right, Bear, how do you manage player creativity when it might clash with raw? So the, the, the idea that um, restriction, Boundaries, um, end zones, stifle creativity is a horseshit um, term used by people who don't understand how creativity works. Limitations is what fuels creativity. Necessity yes, 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 yes. Mother of invention for a reason. Uh, look at Jaws, the movie Jaws, Steven Spielberg. Limited budget, sharks not working, got to shoot on a schedule. Oh, well, he's going to have to get real fucking creative. Then look at, I don't know, one of the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. Ungodly budget. The digital world at his command can do anything he wants. His creativity is garbage because his first idea gets to come to life immediately with no consideration, no restriction, no nothing. Just do what he wants. Mm -hmm. By having those restrictions in the game, you're allowing the player to find a creative way to do what they want to do as opposed to just, I want to do this, so I'm going to do it. Uh, and that's what's important. So for me, any player that starts balking at that or whining at that will get this conversation from me. And if they continue to balk and complain and whine, I'm going to say, well, maybe you shouldn't be playing then because you're clearly not willing to compromise anything, which is a clear indicator to me that as the campaign goes on, you're going to be a giant pain in the ass to deal with at the table. And maybe I don't want that in my game. So yes, it's a benefit to fuel creativity. And it's also a great litmus test to see whether someone's going to be a dick or not in your game. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think we even said it the last couple of streams is just the limitations, you know, and I'm not trying to derail the topic here, but 5e allows you to do everything and people are the most unimaginative nonsense players ever in, you know, 1e, 2e, basic, whatever. Or again, Earth, Earth is even a better example. Those disciplines are so not limited, but they, they have a scope, an intentional scope, a lifestyle you must live but within that, you have infinite possibilities. You just have a couple of hooks, like the stick master that you can be <laughs> in Earth. Um, and people look at, oh, that game is so closed-minded. No. Now is when your creativity is ready to shine. Make that interesting. What's up, Bear? Well, it's something I learned with Heroic, because when I first put Heroic together, there were no pre-recreated powers. 
there was instructions on how to make a power, but the idea was do it the heroic way. Make up what your power does, give it a rank, and play the goddamn game. Well, sadly, the pushback we got on that was, yeah, but... Uh, and I started to understand not having this problem, the, 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 the freedom paralysis that would hit people without having the, the guidelines there. They didn't know what to fucking do, right? They cannot pass go, cannot start the game, cannot slap the puck, whatever you want to do. So now we had to put in pre-made powers to help them. Yes, we spend a lot of the book saying, don't focus on this, but if you must, here they are for you. But we really push the other way of thinking, right? So again, people, people will be people, and they're going to go in their ways. 5e is a very complex game. Uh, 5e has a lot of little moving pieces and what have you. I have a friend of mine who is a master of 5e as a player, and he's learned the rules backwards and forwards, and he makes these rogue characters that I just want to beat to death. Actually, I just want to beat him to death with a shovel <laughs> at the table when he shows up, because literally it'll be like this. All right, Max, what are you doing your turn? I move and I do this. Uh, Crash, what are you doing? Okay, I do this, I do this. Okay, Lord of do this. Then we get to him. What eight things are you doing this round, sir? Because he has the game all figured out, and he knows what to do to get all of these bonuses and moves and what have you, because that's how his brain works so having all those rules in place gave him structure that forced him to get creative to do what he wanted to do whereas if he was playing fate he'd be bored out of his eyes because he can't game in fate he can't think about how well this cool thing connects to that cool thing and then that gives me this unexpected result that wasn't really there but look at this thing i've created through my choice of rules and powers and what have you so i think it's a benefit and I think it appeals to different types of creativity, and uh, it's a good thing. Okay. What's my follow-up question? Oh, I, you don't want to count that as your follow-up question? Okay, fine. That's my follow-up question. I'm going to get a drink. You suck. I need coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Crafty, how do you manage player creativity when it might clash with rules as written? Well, the other two people have already basically said it, is that honestly, like, rules in, it rules in a game, it, it breeds creativity if you're allowed to do whatever it is that you want like when we were kids right we didn't get we didn't get dessert until we ate our dinner right but if we could eat ice cream anytime that we wanted we'd get sick on ice cream because that's what it is right so when you look at 5e right you always hear these horror stories of people who they'll create their character and then they get bored of the character and they want to just keep creating more and more and more characters. That's because they made the right? level one character that uh, was developed as a level 15 or level 35 assassin, right. killed the prince and did all this stuff. But you're level one? What's my backstory? Shut up. But well, but but besides that, right? So so in in five E, they just they keep creating new characters because they keep coming up with these concepts of Oh man, like the rules are going to allow me to like what Bear was mm -hmm. saying, right? Yep. You'll get those players that like, oh man, I can do all this stuff. And then you start playing it and then you start going onto forums and message boards and you're like, holy crap, I've got this like dragon rider nuke destroyer. And then over here, I've got this, you know, this, and, and so you keep and in their mind, this is, oh man, this is so creative. I can't believe I'm coming up with these ideas of creative, but when you have when you have to sit down with the game master you have to sit down with the other players and you have to go okay i have this character concept how can we fit this into the rules or 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 sitting down and discussing action right this is why players should never ask for roles but should describe action describe action first and then describe how you're going to make the role with or or not describe how you're gonna make the role but discuss with the game master how you're going to make that role right so like if if you know you wanted to slide across the table and you know between the uh between the troll's legs and come around it and you wanted to hack off you know uh, it's uh, achilles tendon right that's that's creative i'm sure in 5e there's a feat or something combination that will allow you to do that but when you're sitting down and you're talking with the game master, okay, how are we going to get this done? Then it's so much more satisfying after you reach that point. If you sit down with a character concept and you're like, this is the type of character that I want to be, 5e will let me make it. Once you've made the character, you're like, crap, now I'm bored. Now I want to play a different character because there's no restrictions. You're eating ice cream all of the time. 
and you're going to get sick on ice cream or you're going to get bored of ice cream. Yep. I agree. Um, I'm going to put a scenario out there for you guys. Uh, Crafty, I'm sure you've heard this before. Bear may have as well. It's the scenario Cave that it happened. In. What's that? Cave it in. Cave it in. Oh, not oh, that no, scenario. No, no, not that scenario, no. <laughs> God, do you know how many typos I had in that thing? Oh. <laughs> I, trust me, I know. <sighs> So what happens when you take a year off before you, you know, between looks at it. Uh, anyway, so I was in in uh, uh, Jim's alcoves. Uh, he goes by Forge and Brush Gaming. Now, by the way, I love him as a game master. And we talked about this after the facts. And this isn't how he would normally handle the situation. But his table was raw. So there came a situation where I'm playing a fighter in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And it has a really stupid rule. This is what I was doing. I was in front of the group. I can't remember if this was towards the door. It doesn't matter. I did this constantly anyway. And I kept my shield up. Now, keeping my shield up costs an action. That does not bother me. I'm taking the effort to hold the shield up so that it uses up one of my actions. Literally doesn't bother me at all. But what bothered me was one time I was holding my shield up, but I was holding my action waiting for something to happen. By the rules of the game, the moment you take an action, you must take all of your actions. You cannot continue to hold. And by literally just standing there walking forward with my shield up, since that's considered an action round by round, I could not hold my action or I could not have my shield up. Oh, hold on, Bear. No, no, oh, I, I, I want to before we leave this point, though. Yeah, oh, no, no. no. I actually want all your take, takes on this one. And this is one of those areas. Now, he easily is a game master, and I know what he wanted to do, but the table wasn't set up to do that. The table was set up to look up every damn rule every round, <laughs> uh, figure out exactly how it's supposed to work by the description of the rule in the game, and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't allow it. He couldn't. I had to have my shield down or I couldn't hold my action to do what I, you know, what I was prepared for. So that is a time when raw gets in the way. And I'll let bear start on this one. Uh, but that is a time when raw gets in the way where a house rule would have been better. Go ahead, bear. That wasn't what I wanted to talk about, but I will oh. address that after, but Matt didn't answer your question. You asked him, how does a character that doesn't want to do something that isn't available in Raw and how does he deal with it? Instead, he went on a diatribe about how 5e is ice cream all the time and old school's better. He didn't answer your question. You let it slide. So I'm calling you and I'm calling him on that one. Just just for the record. Now, as to your thing, uh, that's my house rules. Like oh, and that, well, hold, hold on, Bear. So, so Really quickly, I did answer the question. I did answer the question in saying that I agree with everything that Bear and Lord Maddie that, that, said, but I'm going to add him. this on. Oh, is that is that okay? So we're adding it on. Is yeah, that because you guys up? because you guys said exactly what I was going to say. That, okay, that honestly, I'll, restrict, I'll restrictions. <laughs> yeah, restrictions often breed the best creativity. Yes, I will allow that as a, I will accept the ruling because all I heard was a lot of crapping on 5e and singing the praises of OSR. So, but but, <sighs> but, but since we started with you, Bear, uh, I mean, do you have, oh, no, no. So do you see what I'm talking about where Raw got in the way there? Yes, Raw can get in the way. Raw can absolutely get in the way because no game, okay, look, working on Heroic, do you know what I mean? You would, you, I wish I could show you the amount of messages I've received that are, hey, this rule could be abused this way, or this thing could be done. You know, someone could use this and they could do this. And, the, and you know, what my answer to everybody who does that to me is hmm. cool. I'm not designing a game to police your table. If your players can figure that out, God bless them. They figured out how to use the rules to their advantage. That's what half the game's about. Enjoy it. But no game designer can think of every possible right. situation, unless it's you know McCracken and in, 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 you know in, in uh, Cinnabar, and obviously you know he's thought about it. <laughs> I got no. It is the perfect game. Okay, um, how do I ban bear? Crafty, you're a mod ban bear. <laughs> but the point, the point being is that since, since no one can think of every possible situation that a player could come up with in a game, you need to have the game have one of two things: either a set of mechanics that are so fluid like heroic where you could just say hey all right that's going to be a remarkable difficulty give me a roll you need a yellow and off to the races you go without having to worry about it or be willing to say you know what that is kind of dumb so that rule we're going to add a little house rule addendum if holding your action this does not apply so that way you can still take your action at the time when your action becomes available Would you, so a house rule yeah well, you have to in those yeah. situations you're going to have or a, or a ruling if you will, to make the OSR crowd feel better. A ruling. Which is just a house rule. Uh, crafty. 
Uh, so the, the going with the scenario that I gave out there, especially since you are the raw fanatic, we'll say in this one, how would you handle that situation? I, I'm going to have to, again, defer back to Bear, and he's going to love hearing that he's right, is that you okay. is honestly, um, if if in discussing the rule back and forth, it did not um, it did not cover that particular situation. Oh, no. The rule was very clear. If you hold your action, you cannot take any other actions. As soon as you take an action, you must take them all. You cannot continue. You can't hold between actions. And right. raising a shield, but, just doing the raise the shield action, which is what me moving forward with my shield constantly up at all times is, it, is considered an action. Okay, so I'm going to use that example, right? So <laughs> did you raise? did you raise your shield or did you have your shield raised from your previous action? My shield, I always described it as my shield was always up as I'm walking forward. Then then you did not take an action to well, raise it, your shield. The, eff the effort still costs an action, and I'm okay with that. Because you get like I, three of them or whatever. I don't, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. So, but again, you have already raised your shield in a previous action. Therefore you raising your shield it, it's kind of like it's kind of like readying a it, it's it's yeah, you know, a weapon and their, and their clones readying yeah. is an if then statement right and they even carried that through into fifth edition i believe it was in fourth edition even it's an if then statement it's in a lot of editions yeah yeah it's so if this happens then i will do this so <laughs> now now go back it, you were, you had your shield raised and you yep. were holding your action. What were you going to do with your held action? I don't remember exactly, but I was waiting for somebody to do something and then I was going to do something. I, I forget okay. what the exact it's it's on it's recorded. I could go find out, but yeah. <laughs> because if your if your readied action was I'm going to hold my or or I'm going to wait for somebody to attack and then I'm going to raise my shield against it, then then that is that is raw, right? But Again, I'm going to rule that in your previous action because combat segments are only six seconds. You're not going to go like you're literally not going to do this with your shield, right? You're not going to, you know. No, no, the, the the action point cost was just to uh, to uh, show I, the effort yeah. of keeping it up. I would need to. I would need to see the rule because. I got it. Believe me, the because discussion it, at the, the table is about yeah. a half hour long before the ruling finally came down that the the way the book describes it is what Nerds Nerd put in chat, uh, which is, no, I either can have it up or I have to let it be down and then I can hold my action to do the whatever okay, I was but, going to but do. Because right I didn't have a specific but in, trigger. In, but so what a nerd, if, if, if you wanted to put it on screen so that everybody can read it, what it says is it says that you can raise a shield and ready an action Okay, but you can't raise a shield and delay an action. But what if your shield is already raised? Every round you have to declare the raise. That, see, but that, in my mind, that doesn't make sense because that's you just doing this. I mean, You're you know, raising it, lowering it, raising it, lowering it. Read it the same way, and it wasn't that. Now, me, I think I, I'm with you on this one, but I'm saying they are all experienced Pathfinder players at the table. They're all because they have easy. Pathfinder mind. Yes, yeah, that, <laughs> right. So, Pathfinder yeah. mind. Oh, what, what's right. that? But <laughs> playing the no. game as written. So, right. No, I get that. But this is why. This is again why discussion needs to happen. Now you said that the discussion lasted for thirty minutes. I, I would say it lasted, it lasted for yeah. quite a while. You again, you can okay. watch it in the video, the back and forth, and then a couple other players getting involved uh, in what's that foundry putting the rule up on the screen and looking through. Yeah. So then I what I do is then I appreciate I appreciate the fact that you guys actually took the time to read the rule and then a ruling was made right? The ruling was made that it wasn't in your favor, but you took the time to discuss the rule as written. Yeah, the only time this negatively affected me was when I was holding the action. I don't want to take too much. I mean, and a nerd search right here. Raise shield lasts until the beginning of your next turn. Right. But because I was holding my action for, I, I guess I didn't have a specific trigger. I don't remember that I had to drop it or I had to take my action. So during that round, and I don't think anything bad happened to me. It's just the point of like, this is silly. I have to drop okay. my shield in order to wait to do the thing that I need to do. <laughs> okay, whatever. Well, Lord, Lord Matty has to go, but the but 
in in terms of the question, how do you manage player creativity, right? If if you can if you can raise your shield and and then and and uh, hold an action, right? Could you say I'm going to raise my shield and then declare that if somebody attacks me, I am going to repost? Yeah, I'd have to watch the video. To remember what it was, but. Right. So I guess but, the, the point that I'm yeah. making is that sometimes and that's what the question was. How do you manage player creativity when it might clash with raw? That was a perfect time when it clashed with raw because I wanted to keep moving forward with my shield up, peeking around the side or peeking over top, whatever. And it worked perfectly. Sure. I gave up an action. I understand the exertion, but then we ran into this scenario where it just game comes to a screeching halt we're all looking up the rule they're trying to figure it out and even the game master was like normally i just would have made the rule that yeah you can keep it up but that table wasn't conducive to that because they were very raw oriented lord Mattius, go ahead and, uh what's up i i just i i take it you i don't know pathfinder 2 at all so i yeah. i don't really feel like i should be saying anything but presumably keeping the shield raise gave you some kind of defensive bonus as opposed to yes, not keeping yes. up. yep right so, I, I mean, I, just based on the cursory discussion we've had right now, I would have kind of done something with Crafty was doing. I would have cut through a lot of the uh, rigmarole, just said, when you're just walking around and, you're, and that's your description of what your character's doing, that's just a description. You're not uh, using a rule. I would. That's how I would have looked at it. Be like, sure. And the moment combat starts, we're rolling initiative, and that's when you're going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, and then I'm going to attack, and yeah. Would you have lost the AC bonus if you got attacked first and therefore lost that descriptive thing that you were going for as you're moving through the dungeon? Yeah, maybe. But uh, well, this was uh, in combat. Like, we, I think we were breaking through a door or something. I just don't remember. And I don't yeah. want to. You know. But I, I think, again, without knowing the deep, the intricate rules, it's hard to say. But um, I, th I, I want to say there may have been a way to do it without yeah, yeah. The yeah. And, and the thing is, is is like i said i talked to james elcove and this is the last thing i'm going to say on this because we got to move on uh is even he was like normally he would have just been like yeah it's up it's not a big deal but that table was very rules as yeah. written oriented they, i'm telling you they looked up everything crafty last word we got to move on last word is there's always rule zero but then there's always addendum zero and i'm going to have to go with addendum zero which is uh if if you're not familiar with the rules or you're not going to read the rules, don't argue with people who have. And this is just one of those cases. Yeah, that's fair. Yep, that's fair. Uh, all right. Uh, I think we're ready to move on to the next segment. I'm going to read a little bit of chat here. The next segment is going to be on tailoring the experience. So we're going to actually dive into the house rules a bit more. Uh, so we're going to be getting away from Crafty's realm and a little more into the bear realm here in a moment. Before we do that, let's hit some hit some chat up here. There is one that just came in a moment ago that I want to uh, pop up. So there we go, that one. All right, so I only have two starred. Oh, well, apparently I have one starred because Bob Vecna, thank you very much for a member for 12 months. Really appreciate it. They can't have a game born from the imagination of an insurance uh, underwriter and be surprised that the rules can be contradictory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about Gary Gygax, obviously. Yeah, you know, fair, fair. You know, the other thing is, and I think all these guys have said it, the game literally, no game in this world can literally cover everything. I, I, I said this a few times before, I'll say it again. I know a game that has a 5,000 page rule book. And it still doesn't cover everything. It's been in the works since 1983. You know, so um, anything you guys want to say about what this? What game is that? It's, uh, it's called JTLS Go. You can look it up. Oh, okay. It's a military simulation. It's for the government, but it's it's public domain. You can oh, you can, so that's why it's not done. Okay. Well, it's <laughs> not being written by the government, though. It's being it's uh it's just one of those things. But it's five thousand page. I had to go through one week of training on it, and that was actually after everybody else had gone through. So I was so lost, man. But uh, all right, uh, Bear, uh, Lord Maddie, you want to? Uh, okay, we'll move on to the next uh, next one then. Tabletop Family, once again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, if you are not subscribed to Tabletop Family, please do so. Uh, check him out. He's got a little over a thousand subscribers. Got some good content out there. Uh, a little bit more wholesome than what you might find here, but you should check him out. Ask the question. I don't normally do the non-super chat ones, but we'll put this up here because I think this is a really good one. Uh, I want to ask an unrelated question. I'm interested in limiting my players to only play characters that are their same sex. I'm not even going to read any further yet. That's exactly the rule at my table. 
I do not let people play. Uh, look, you having pointed ears or a big bearded dwarf when you're actually a skinny kid, I can get over. You trying to be a chick or some chick trying to be a dude ruins my immersion, and that's important to me. I simply don't allow it. And for this last part here, males play as males. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, but anybody, you see yet another comment, sorry, where people are lighting you up for, ignore those people. They're retarded. Now, that doesn't mean you can't allow it. If Crafty's table wants to allow dudes to play chicks, I don't care. You're just not going to do it at my table. Uh, you guys have any so, comments about that? Oh, I So do. here's the thing, right? The thing, the, the thing is, is that your table, your rules. There is no rule in the book that says that you have to play as a male or you have to play as a female if you're a female. In that particular case and going over into the next segment is you just simply make a house rule that, hey, you know what, I'm sorry, but this this ruins my immersion, right? And yeah, so, but, <laughs> but don't let, don't let somebody else, right? Because oftentimes what happens is this question gets asked or you sit there and say, what happens is you say, hey, I really only want, you know, boys to play boys, girls to play girls, whatever. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is that the the people will respond to you with a Mont and Bailey attack. Is, is they'll say, well, you know, what if this is the concept of my character. And then when you go, well, I understand that, but that's not, what we do at the table and then their Bailey, their, their moral high ground is, well, why don't you like diversity? I've, I've never, let, never run into that. That sounds yeah. very modern, but I just flat out say, right. uh, like it's cause there's a couple of people, even in our old nineties group, be like, I like, I want to play a chick. No, why not? Because yeah. I don't I don't allow it. You will play your sex. That is just the way it's going to be. And it never even turned oh. into a big argument. So. Well, uh, the bear just turned into a Klingon, so. <laughs> I, I, I want to say something real quick, but then we'll unleash the bear. Um, I, I'm kind of agnostic on this. Generally, I'm <laughs> uncomfortable if someone's going to do it. Um, but I, I have a good friend. I haven't gamed with him in a while, but he, he tends to play chicks, and he's very respectful. He's not, like, you know, being gross or anything like that. It's just this thing. Uh, so, and I'm not going to tell him no because we have a good time when we're gaming, and, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, no, to be fair, um, you game differently than I game. Oh, no, I know, I know. I, this, You're definitely I more beer and pretzel side where you're probably, you know, because me, immersion's important. Ask Bear yeah. in his game, like the way he runs his game. And yeah, we know Bear's oh. still got to say his thing. So there is a difference in it. At a table that's a little bit more just laid back, I could absolutely see it. Yeah, well, I, well, to be fair, I, this guy in particular is also incredibly, he plays very immersively as well. I mean, like, okay. he, like I, well, that's what I mean by, like, he's not gross. He's not being like, I got these big boobs, dude, or anything <laughs> like that. You know, he's just like, I'm, I'm a chick. There's this any is, chicks this, there I want to do them. Do them, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's <laughs> that's good. Uh, you know, he's very All right, so he plays. It's about but, to explode. But, but I, 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 I generally don't like it, but at the same time, I don't really care because if, as long as you're enjoying yourself at my table and, and, and you're not disruptive and you're not causing a problem for anyone else, I, I just don't care. You know what I mean? That's fair. So, That's go ahead. All right, Bear. Go. Well, 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 well. We find ourselves talking about one of the great classic things in games. And, and my good friend Crafty Matt made a statement, a proclamation. The rule book does not tell you you have to play your own gender. This is true. Many rule books do not. But there are some games, such as Villains and Vigilantes, where you're making yourself as the character in the rules. As oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, yes. That's so, right. therefore, the rules are, in some situations, <laughs> telling you something. Now, when it comes to a line in my game, fuck no. Fuck no, 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 and fuck no. And I don't know if I'm supposed to swear anymore on your channel, but I want to drive the point home on this one. I don't care how good a role player you are. No woman can think like a man, and no man can think like a woman. And I'll fight cancel. all the lefty liberal cancel people that want to fight me on this one, but I studied psychology and I worked in violent fields where human behavior was what kept me and my team alive. Literally alive. We think differently. I have seen far too many men play women and they become lesbians so fast. It's amazing how they become lesbians like light speed. And I've seen far too many women play men who become drunken, sex obsessed, 
punch throwers at every turn because the stereotypes and the prejudices will manifest and they will come to the surface. So save yourself all that problem and say, hey, Matt, you're a dude. You're playing dudes. Mateus, you're a I'm dude. I'm glad you're you recognize it. <laughs> Liao, you're a dude. You're playing dudes. Uh, Nuwanda, you're transgender, but you present as a female. You'll play a female. And then just leave it at that. And if someone insists and pushes the point, much like my earlier point, they're not for your table. Mm. Because if they're going to fight you on that hill, they're going to fight you on every fucking hill that comes up. And your campaign will be no fun because Bob the Pill wants to be a pain in the ass all the time. Not Bob Beckner. He's a great guy. And that's what I have to say on that. Yeah, I, like I said, my, mine's very quick. I just say no. And if the person asks why, I just say I don't allow it. That, I mean, if I have to do the immersion thing, I will. But that's it. I, I don't even entertain it after that. If the person complains more. I just keep saying the answer is no. You're going to be a dude. You know, or you're going to be a chick if it's a female. That's it. And then we just move on. And I've never really had anybody huff and puff too much about it. I've had a couple people beg, but nobody huffed and puffed about it. So oh, I've never anybody... had, I just want to say, I've never really had the issue of someone getting gross. You know what I mean? Like, oh, like what Bear was man, saying. You I, I I done the uh, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, obviously. I'm just saying I haven't had that experience. And if someone was doing that, there would be a stern talking to, and because that, that I, I won't allow that on my at my table. That's that fair. kind of thing. Uh, but like I said, like this one guy in particular, my buddy Brian, um, that I haven't gamed with in years, but we used to do a podcast together. That's just like his thing, and he does a really great nice job. He's, you know what I mean? Why would I say no? I mean, I, I, but then again, I trust him. You know what I mean? He trusts me. So if the, if I didn't know him, and, and to be fair, the first time I gamed with him, I was like, "You're playing what? Oh, okay." You know, and I just was like, well, I'm not the game master in the session. In the session, so I'll, I'll let it, you know, see what happens here. But so I thought you were. Right, there crafty, is a wrap, really, wrap it up because we are really yeah. late for the next segment. <laughs> there is a there is a really low budget movie called The Gamers, where one of the guys plays a chick, Games and the Dorcas joke, Rising. yeah, Dorcas Rising, and the the running joke is that he constantly forgets he's playing a chick. <laughs> yes, and the chick version of the character is my friend Jen Page, by the way. She's awesome. Great channel. I talked to Ghost. Go subscribe to her. She's awesome. And a gamer. But yeah, no, no. And this is the thing, right? So let's move on to the next one. Let's not belabor this point. Everybody runs their game the way they run their game. Yep. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> T Tabletop Family got the longest answer ever out of not super chatting. So congratulations, yeah. sir. Um, uh, Squirrel Hermit says here, in my opinion, a ruling only becomes a house rule if it's consistently applied after the initial call. I can I can see that. I can, you know. All right. Uh, let's uh, get into, so the next segment is going to be on tailoring the experience. I read the super chats here, so let me put up the little thingy here so I know when to chop out the video side of it. Uh, if you think you have some presence and charisma, the ability to entertain and educate a good AV setup free from noise pollution and an interest in discussing tabletop RPGs in this format, join the Some Rando RPG Livestream Discord. The link is in the description. To stay tuned for future topics, help us get to know you and maybe... You can join us here and we'll let you on. Um, I'm trying to work on I, work has been a pain in the butt, but uh, I've been or life in general. But I'm trying to get the uh, segments for January and February up soon, very soon. So people can start planning that stuff out. 